in the coming days. Simon says, we're uh, kicking off a, a series uh, a little bit on the life of uh, the man we call Peter, um, known in this Bible as Simon Peter. Uh, I haven't done a series on like the life of a person in the Bible for well over a decade. I think the last time I ever did anything close to being like a life story or a character study was King David, and we're talking mm, the early 2000s, I'm pretty sure, since I've done anything like this. Uh, anyway, uh, I, this, this, this title, Simon Says, I, I'm kind of, uh, we're not going to play the children's game each week or anything like that, um, but I grabbed on to uh, that phrase because first of all, as I thought about Simon, it's the first thing that came to my mind, right? It's such a common part of our language. And, uh, you know, I, I did a little research thinking, well, maybe there's like a medieval connection, you know, like uh, when you hear stories of little children's games like Ring Around the Rosy and things like that. Maybe, maybe there's a connection between the biblical person of Peter and all. No, nothing. All it is is an alliteration. It just kind of goes along as Simon says, you know. We could have called it Bob says, but it just doesn't have that alliteration. So that's why it's lasted all this long. However, I still wanted to play with that phrase a little bit and use it because um, I wanted to look at Peter's life and figure out for ourselves what's the message of Peter's life? What does Peter's life say? Hey, how did I get here? Why, why Peter? You know, there's a lot of people in the Bible. Well, um, I kind of decided in the spring last year that as I looked into the fall and maybe into the winter that I would preach through the two letters in the New Testament, First and Second Peter. Never done it before. So, uh, you know, at this stage, I'm always looking for clean pages in my Bible that I haven't preached through yet. I've done sermons using passages. I thought, well, we'll preach on First and Second Peter. But then I thought, well, if you're going to do that, I should spend one or two weeks talking about, well, who is Peter that wrote First and Second Peter? So in my mind, I thought we'd spend one or two weeks. Then I bought, uh, I looked around, there weren't a lot of books about Peter himself. I found one. Um, you'll hear me referencing it a lot because I, I was shocked by how really helpful and great a book it was. A little book called uh, Peter, um, A Fragile Stone by Michael Card. And uh, I brought that book with me on vacation, again, thinking I was going to get a couple of sermons maybe, uh, ideas as a background. But that just kind of exploded the significance of Peter to, for me. Um, two days in a pouring rainstorm in my dining tent, I wrote about 40 pages of notes in a journal just from that one book. And so I want to take a look at Peter. And, uh, you know, there's, there aren't all that many people in the Bible, if you really think about it, who are given a whole lot of kind of biography or uh, personal information about them. You know, we can think of a whole bunch of Bible characters and we can have a little Bible quiz team and know who, you know, what part of the Bible these people are in, but there's not all that many that we kind of really get any kind of an idea of what kind of people they were. If you think about it, you know, you think, well, like, who are the ones that, that come off the top of your head? In my mind, I think there's a lot of stuff about Abraham, there's a lot of stuff with Moses, a lot of conversations and relationships that he's in. Um, King David, obviously, a whole ton, plus he wrote all those psalms which express his feelings, so we seem to know a lot about David. Maybe Jeremiah, we were just doing that Jeremiah series of all the prophets, we know more about him. Peter is that guy in the New Testament that we have a lot of material upon. You think about the people that we don't have anything on. Uh, the first one I thought of was Adam. Wouldn't you like to know more about what Adam was like? Wouldn't, like, I, I'm curious. I'd love to know, you know, what, what did Adam look like? You know, uh, how strong was Adam? How smart was Adam? Uh, you know, Adam lived, according to the Old Testament, over 900 years. Yet, what do we know about him? Nothing. Bad choice in fruit. Um, you know, we, we, he gets mentioned a lot, but always in a theological, like, like Adam's name comes up a lot, but we don't get any details about his life. So when we do get details about someone's life in the Bible, God's inspired word, there's got to be a reason behind it. So if we do get all of these stories about Peter and we know things about him, why is that? What's the reason? Why does the Bible have so much to say about 
Peter. Uh, a few uh, details about Peter, some facts. Um, in, in pictures from medieval times, I, I told Phil to click through these, uh, you, you, you'll see always Peter, every picture, Peter's hanging onto a giant set of keys. We're talking men's restroom at a gas station size keys. Like these are big keys everywhere. That's how you're supposed to be able to identify, well, who is this guy in this picture? Well, that's Peter. He's got these giant keys. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, that, that's a little place where we uh, part ways with the Roman uh, Catholic Church um, because they hang on to a passage we're going to look at a little later today that talks about Jesus giving Peter these keys to the kingdom. You know, it's interesting, uh, um, Tiago was talking about, and in our, uh, in our catechism, we talked about the kingdom of grace. I thought, hey, grace, you could be thinking about that. You know, Caleb's supposed to be praying for the coming of the kingdom of grace. So next time he gives you, gr gives you grief, you can know, hey, hey. Uh, anyhow, you know, in, in Catholicism, they, they want to need to be able to trace their, the authority of their leader all the way back to the original leader, Peter, who very likely from history was the leader of the church in Rome at the end of his life. So it's kind of like they got franchise rights. Because, you know, our guy was the one given the keys, and then he passed the keys on, and he passed the keys on. It's amazing, all these generations of men that knew where their keys were. But anyhow, all of the keys have been passed on, so this, this is the importance of this story for them. That shows the dominance of, they, they've, so now if you have those keys, whether or not a person is in or out of that strain of the church is really important. So that's another thing about Peter, that he's controversial. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. He's referred to almost 200 times in the New Testament, 200 times. The apostle John wrote far more scripture and is arguably as close or closer in his relationship from how we see it with Jesus, yet he is only mentioned like 31 times compared to 200. That's pretty lopsided. Again, why? Why do we get so much material about Peter? Jesus renames his, he starts out, his name is really Simon. Jesus renames him Peter. We're going to see very early in his life story, yet Jesus never calls him Peter. When I read that, I'm like, oh, that can't be right. No, you look back, Jesus is always referring to him as Simon, even though he names him Peter and talks about his name being changed. What's that all about? He was a sibling to one of the other 12 apostles. I don't know, I think about that often enough. You know, we talk about Peter, his brother's name, Andrew. But, you know, you, you forget that he had also a brother, somebody that had been part of his life all along, one of the 12 apostles. Um, beyond that, he had a large home. Uh, Peter seems to have lived in a, at least a two-story home. And uh, with his wife, likely another uh, number of his children, um, his mother-in-law lived there in that home, and some Bible scholars think that Peter's house, through Jesus' public ministry, was the closest thing Jesus had to a home office or a home base as well. He was a small businessman. He was a professional fisherman, not only with his brother, this is interesting, but with two of the other apostles. So there are only 12 apostles. Four of them have known each other so long and were so close that they were in business together in a fishing business. So that's interesting. Jesus doesn't start his group of 12 apostles with all complete strangers. There would have been this group of four among that 12 that had a whole lot of history together before they ever met Jesus. Peter was likely not formally educated beyond synagogue training, so he would have been literate but not highly trained. Um, we find out from 1 Corinthians 9 that he later traveled with his wife on missionary journeys. He talked funny. Peter talked funny. He had a Galilean accent. So people would say, oh, you're, a Gal you're, a, you're one of the Galileans. You're, you're a follower of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, to have a Galilean accent um, and be placed as the leader of this movement um, there in the city of Jerusalem and in the beginning of the church, not a big, that wasn't a really distinguished sound. Uh, you know, guys that are, those of us that are preachers and we work on our insecurities, we hear somebody like Alex, Alistair Begg. 
with his great Scottish accent, and they always sound so profound, right? Like there are certain dialects and sounds that depending on where you're from, oh, that guy's really smart. That's not what you're going to get from a Galilean accent. Interesting. Jesus chooses one who's going to be a spokesman for his movement, and he has this accent that's not going to be really highly esteemed by people. He was the first one called by name by Jesus. He was the first person in the New Testament to confess his sinfulness to Jesus. He receives the most severe rebukes of all of the disciples in the New Testament. Is that because he was especially mistake prone? I don't think so anymore. I think it's more to do with he's representative. He's a representative He's a representative spokesperson for the 12. And, and Jesus' rebukes of Peter aren't really just rebukes of Peter. They're warnings for all of us and warnings for the 12. He uh, is involved in at least seven miraculous stories. Um, he's obviously second to Jesus in every story, but he's still a leading, supporting character in so many of the important stories of Jesus' ministry. Um, he had a big authority in the book of Acts. And if there is a lot of pushback from us as non-Roman Catholics against this supremacy of Peter, we are probably guilty of underappreciating Peter's importance. Um, we've been accused of elevating the Apostle Paul in our strain of things and really um, disrespectful to how important Peter was. Uh, just an example of that. I think in my own preaching, when I was a youth pastor, whatever, and I tell the stories of Peter, and we, we've developed uh, all these barnacles on the, the ship that is Peter's life, uh, all these extra biblical ideas. Oh, well, Peter's always sticking his foot in his mouth. Peter's always, he's very impulsive. Peter's, you know, he's, he's this big, goofy fisherman that makes all these mistakes, but if, you know, if Jesus can use him, he can use you, that kind of thing. And I think we've really kind of added all of that in. I don't think that's Peter at all anymore. In my mind, Peter, Simon, Simon Peter is disciple 1.0. He's disciple 1.0, and his storyline goes from being called to be a disciple until what does a mature disciple look like? Um, I, I realize that he is a big A apostle. There are only the 12 apostles, so that makes Peter unique. And that kind of, in some ways, elevates him, right? However, I think that Peter's primary role is that he's one of us. This, here's the question I have for you. What does Christ-likeness look like in a person that's not Christ. And Peter provides this incredible example of that. Because, you know, we have the incarnation happens. Jesus comes, He's God incarnate, He's the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. John talks about that in his gospel. And He's Jesus. He's fully God. He's fully man. Peter is that bridge where, okay, what about when it's just a man? It's just a man indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the way that Jesus promised men would be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? That's why Peter is so important for us. Not so much that he's elevated as the Apostle Peter and therefore a complete different... That's not a different race than we are. That's, that's a disciple of Christ, called to be a disciple, changed and transformed in his life, and, and eventually a mature disciple. Um, I think when Peter, uh, like I said, when he gets his rebukes, those rebukes are for us. When he is shown to be in a close relationship with Jesus, I think Jesus is showing uh, an example of how close he means to be in a relationship with us. I hope that you'll see and appreciate that in Peter, there's a change. There's a change. Uh, in, in movies and in novels, there's, a, there's this thing called the narrative arc, right? Right? where a character, especially if it's a good story, if it's a good long story or a movie about a person and they're going to tell their life story, they have to tell their life story in an hour and a half. And what you want to see is there's some change in the person. There's, there's this narrative arc that happens. Well, we get that in Peter. We get this narrative arc where Jesus at the very beginning has some words that talk about where Peter's life is going to go, what Peter's going to become. 
And, and it's not based on some necessarily these characteristics that are already there in Peter. And if he just believed in himself enough, uh, he'd, he'd become the best version of himself and he'd realize his potential. No, Jesus sees, says things to him about his future, and Peter, through his life, grows in that transformation. I, I want us to kind of see that happening. Um, there's some things in these stories we're going to look at where Jesus, uh, this, these names, he, he, Jesus, the thing I want to focus on today are the name change. What's in the name? He's Simon. That's the most common first name in first century Judea. That's the, it's like, you know, I joke about being, my name's John, you know, first day of kindergarten, there's five of us in the class, right? It's a very common name. Peter was the most common name. Jesus names him uh, uh, Simon, sorry, Simon was, I've just got all that wrong. Simon was the most common name. Jesus gives him this nickname, Peter, Rock, Cephas, um, all these different languages, but it basically means rock. There's no record anywhere of anybody who had rock for his first name. Uh, in, in the first century. So it's not a common name. So there's something more than just uh, changing his name. Jesus saw this guy and go, you know what, you're pretty messed up. We need to give you an image makeover. We're going to just change your name because, uh, you know, that, that's why people legally change their name now usually. There's some dark thing in their past and they want a fresh start, so they're just going to change their name. Or the name doesn't sound uh, Americanized enough, so they change their name so they can fit in with their culture. No, Jesus names him something that is going, it has a message in it as well when he calls him the rock. But Peter is anything but stable and, and strong and immovable. And so where does Jesus see this? As you look at the early stories, you wonder if Jesus was just being sarcastic because it's not very rock-like in the initial stories that come along. Um, Look where he gets to. Let me jump ahead. I don't have slides for this, so you can relax your fingers at the back there trying to work the slides. In the book of Acts, there's a story in, uh, there's a story in the book of Acts. I've just got to look up my reference here where in Acts chapter 4, the very beginning of uh, the, the history of when, when the apostles are now kind of in charge of the show, Jesus has returned to the Father, and uh, in Acts chapter 4, there's this first story where Peter and the apostles are preaching, and they get in trouble, and the authorities arrest them, and they bring them in. This is this Peter who, earlier on in his life story, one of the stories we're going to look at is that little uh, fireside kind of wimp out that happens, where at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest, Peter's warming his hands by the fire. He's followed Jesus, who's been arrested, and the, a servant girl just a little servant girl says, hey, you're one of his followers. No way, not me. That, that Peter, just a couple of months later, this is the same Peter. Look at the change. He gets arrested, got brought before the, uh, brought before the, the Sanhedrin. They get grilled by the most powerful followers. Down in verse 16, they, they send them back out. The leaders say, what should we do with these men? We can't deny they've performed a miraculous sign. And everyone in Jerusalem knows about it, but uh, we got to keep them from spreading their propaganda. So we're just going to warn them not to speak in Jesus' name again. So they bring him in and they commit. These are the powerful guys. These are the guys that were behind closed doors when Peter's afraid of a servant girl. And these guys now command him to stop preaching. This is only a couple of months later. Peter's response, but Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign. So, and as soon as they were freed, they went back to preaching. There's that narrative arc I was talking about. From Simon, a fisherman, to that Peter before the authorities. An incredible change. That's what I want to take a look at. Um, I'm going to be strongly influenced by uh, that, uh, that book I told you about, The Emotional Side of Simon Peter, A Fragile Stone by Michael Card. And here's something that I read from his introduction that I want to read as a quote this morning. Peter is fully himself, whatever gospel you take up. His rich and complex character stays the same, whatever gospel you choose. 
He's the most human. Perhaps that's one reason Jesus seemed to be so attracted to him. So so that's what I want to look at, because like I've said this morning, I hope I've established already, if we have this much biographical material about Peter, it's because we need it. It's because we're supposed to know these things. We're supposed to think about them. And I think in a special way, we're supposed to identify with them. I think Peter's story is our story as well, and we're meant to identify it. So let's just, I'm just going to wrap up things today, mostly now just focusing on this name change thing. That's a long introduction, I know, but it's the beginning of a series. And what's in a name? Turn in your Bibles to the very first chapter of uh, the Gospel of John. This is the very start of, uh, this is John's version of how this relationship, how this character of Peter gets brought into the story. And it's right at the very beginning. Remember, John doesn't have all the Christmas stories. We don't uh, turn to the Gospel of John very often for our Christmas plays or anything like that because he has the first chapter or all those mysterious words about in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. And then boom, jumps right into John the Baptist. This is John chapter 1 jumps right into the stories of John the Baptist, and while he's talking about the stories of John the Baptist, we uh, find out that right away, the Apostle John ratchets the volume up on the identification of who this Jesus person is in the very first stories about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in uh, verse 29 of chapter 1, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one I was talking about. Boom, the lights are on full. This is chapter 1. Here's full-grown adult Jesus, Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist, the great prophet that had huge crowds following him, that's what he says. That's what he, he identifies. And uh, he, he admits, I didn't see it at first, but then, you know, basically God told me that you're, you're, you're going to see a dove from heaven resting upon him. And, he, and when he saw that, he says in verse 34, I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. The following day, John was again standing by with two of his disciples. This is verse 35. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, Jesus says, verse 39. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. They went with them to the place where he was staying. They remained there the rest of the day. Andrew, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. You know this famous story? Because we're going to get to it today. I've already talked about a little bit about the key story. When Jesus says to the disciples, who do you say that I am? First, he says, who do everybody else say that I am? And they give him all the answers. But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of son of Jonah or something like that. We'll see it when I look it up in a minute. Uh, God didn't reveal to this. Men didn't, you didn't, re, you know, men didn't reveal this to you. God did. Well, if I was his brother, Andrew, I'd be like almost wanting to, I don't know if I should say something right now, but uh, very first day, uh, I just met you. I went and got my brother and I told him we found the Messiah, the one. But, you know, probably smart to not do that when, when uh, Jesus is, is speaking. But so here, right at the very beginning, it's, it's Peter's brother, Andrew. What are all the great stories about Andrew? Hey, there's none. Like, you don't really know anything about what happens to Andrew. But here's Andrew bringing his brother. At this point, he's, Andrew's already a Christ follower. That's an important kind of phrase and a description of him at this point. And he brings his brother, Peter, who meets Jesus. Brings his brother Simon. I keep getting ahead of my name change. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. And look at this, right at the beginning. First time Peter's, Simon's ever met Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas. 
which means Peter. So right off the beginning here, um, we've got this whole name change idea. Um, John's, I call this John's nickname narrative. He uses this word that Jesus looked intently at Peter. That's the same word that Luke's going to use later in that fireside kind of flame out that Peter has where he's afraid of a servant girl and he denies Christ. And Luke gives us the detail and Jesus looked intently at Peter. So there's these two intent looks of Jesus in his life story here. But in his, and he seems to look right through him both times. But this time, Jesus looks intently at Peter and he tells him what his life is going to become. Who he's going to be. I don't think Jesus looks in and sees the hidden rock stone. Jesus chooses Simon and tells him, this is a, like a prophecy, this is is who you're going to become. Um, We're going to find out, if you flipped ahead in your Bibles to John chapter 2, you'll see in verse 24 that Jesus had this ability to see through a person, to see through to their innermost being. Um, It's what Peter will become, not what he is, that's so important. Artistic depictions of Peter always seem to make him big. You know, like I said, we have this kind of narrative. He's this big, burly fisherman. There are no descriptions in the Bible of Peter's appearance. Interestingly, there's none of Jesus' appearance either. There's not really a description of many people's appearance other than Goliath, (laughs) maybe Samson. But, But we don't know what Peter looked like. We don't know what Jesus looked like. Um, We... I think we get pulled off by that nickname, Rock, and we make a mountain of a man out of him. But like I said, Simon is the most common name, and nobody was named Rock. There's two more stories I want to look at where the name change is mentioned. The second one's in Luke's gospel. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6, this is a story that has a parallel in the gospel of Matthew. But in Luke chapter 6, this is the famous Jesus is choosing 12 apostles. By the time this story happens, a lot of time has gone by. If John's really describing to us the very first time Peter ever laid eyes on Jesus, the very first time he met him, by this time now, he's been following him for some time. A whole bunch of miracles have happened up until this point. And and take a look at chapter 6. Jesus, uh, he prays all night Then in the morning, he chooses 12. One day soon after, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples. We don't know how many there are. There could have been 60, 70, could have been 100 people following him at this point. He calls them all together, and in front of all of those disciples, he chose 12 of them to be apostles. Here are their names. Boom, Simon, whom he named Peter. At the top of the list. This is an important thing about Simon. He, he gets listed first always. This is where as Protestants, as we're guilty of underemphasizing Peter, he always gets listed at the top. Look who's at the bottom. Take a look at your list. Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. There, there, is, a, there is a bit of a pecking order here. And you'll notice the name change is here already. So, so he, Jesus gave this name when he first met him, and, a, and we get to this story, and it's always being written in. P, Simon, whom he named Peter. Doesn't show Jesus calling him Peter. Calls him as Simon. Um, he already had that nickname before he made varsity. <laughs> That's how I look at it, in being chosen to be one of the 12 apostles. He's given this new identity at the beginning of his relationship with Christ. So it's not something he earns. Okay, Jesus didn't wait. Okay, now that you're one of the 12, I'm going to name you the rock, you know, to, to set yourself up. This is already at the very beginning. This predictive change in his identity is given at the very beginning. Um, a lot, of, Like I said, a lot of things have happened already. There's been the miraculous catch of fish story. Just in the previous chapter in Luke, there's that story where they catch all this fish and then Peter looks at Jesus and says, get away from me. I'm much too sinful of a person to be around you, Jesus. That's already happened before his calling. Um, Jesus doesn't say, oh no, Peter, you're no worse than anybody else. (laughs) You know, 
But, but here's, this, here's this first story of Peter. That's already happened before this choosing. Um, Jesus calls this dirty fisherman to be one of his twelve. He's healed a leper already by touching him, which in the gospel is kind of like gross. He touched him first in Luke and then healed him. He called Matthew, a tax collector, to follow him. That's supposed to make a Jewish reader go, oh, that's gross. And then here he pulls together his twelve. Now turn to Matthew chapter 16. That's probably one of the most famous name change stories I've already referenced. If we turn to Matthew chapter 16, this is the big one. Um, And I want us to just sit here for the rest of our time here this morning. This is a crucial name change story, probably the most famous one. Verses 13 to 20, I'm going to reread just that part for now. Then Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? It's a question of identity, right? Who do people, when they see me, who do they think I am? It's in that context that Peter's going to be reminded of this other name change for him. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Remember that? Remember I said Andrew already kind of found him at the very beginning and said, we found the Messiah. John already said, the, son, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. What's Jesus mean by that in this verse? Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. And how you hear that story? If that story is just about a dialogue between Jesus and Peter, then that's where this supremacy of Peter idea comes from. But if Peter is a seminal disciple, that's a phrase I'm going to throw around a lot in this this series, that he's disciple 1.0, that he's representative of this movement, this new thing that Jesus was establishing, then those words are for all of us. So, Andrew may have said it to him, but what Peter is saying here, he believes it. That's what's really important in this story. That's an important part of putting this puzzle together. What Peter just said, he really believed, and Jesus is recognizing that faith that Peter has that is real right now, and Jesus says, I'm going to build something on that. That belief and faith in who Jesus is and an understanding of who he really is. Um, This is where we split rocks with the Roman Catholic Church. But the book that I already referenced by Michael Card kind of opened my eyes to something I'd never really seen before. There's a major Old Testament background to this little story in exchange. The whole rock idea that I was kind of oblivious to. Keep your finger in Matthew 16 and turn in your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 51. Because way back in the book of Isaiah, God is speaking through the prophet of Isaiah, and he says something very interesting about another important Bible character. Isaiah chapter 15, verse 1. Listen to me, all who hope for deliverance, all who seek the Lord. So this is a word from God to the nation of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. And God says this, Consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were mined. Yes, think about, he goes right to Abraham, think about Abraham, your ancestor, and Sarah, who gave birth to your nation. Abraham was only one man when I called him, but when I blessed him, he became a great nation. There's this story in in the 
book of, there's this, there's this language in Isaiah of God cutting a stone from the quarry and building an entire nation out of that stone. And that stone is Abraham. Okay? And what do we know about Abraham? Abraham had a name change. Abraham started out, he was Abram. God enters into his life, chooses him. God's the rock picker in this story, just as Jesus is the rock picker in the story with Jesus and Peter. God tells this story, you know, this is where the nation of Israel came from. I picked this one stone, and from it, it became the foundation for an entire nation came out of that one stone from the quarry. Here now, Jesus is picking Peter, and he's saying, on this rock, I'm going to build something. Well, what does he build? This is where uh, we get off on two different paths, where some people see Peter now is the entire foundation. <laughs> He's the whole thing. There's the idea of the franchise rights. Only this one branch of the worldwide church of Jesus Christ has all the authority because they're the only ones that are built on the foundation, which is this one guy. Well, here's the thing. Later on in his life, Peter didn't see himself as the rock all by himself. He saw himself as a rock, and it was definitely a rock in part of a building. I know you're getting carpal tunnel by flipping all around your Bibles today, but if you would turn to uh, 1 Peter and take a look at a passage in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, you'll find out that Peter tells all of us that we are stones. Peter sees himself as a stone. He sees Jesus as the stone, and he's the cornerstone where God is building a temple. And we are all parts of this temple where God's presence is going to be made known throughout all of the world, and that's our calling as people. So here's Peter's story. This is what I mean by identifying ourselves with Peter's story. Because we are also part of something that Jesus is using to build his kingdom, uh, part of this temple. So go back and think about this idea of keys, this idea of keys. Um, Jesus picks this one rock and says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Um, Peter becomes important for followers of Jesus, just as Abraham was for Israel, after Jesus returns to the Father, Simon is now a bridge between that physically present, perfect leader that Jesus was and now these very human, flawed, earthly leaders. And Peter's just one of that 12, the 12 first ones of those leaders that we are to identify with. We are to kind of submit to and be in relationship with Christ and follow Him and be, He's to be our vision. We're to display Jesus is the center of all life by uh, our relationships with one another and thriving relationships with God. Peter's not the whole foundation, but a living stone. What do temples have? Temples have doors. What do doors have? They have locks. They have keys. Jesus is telling his disciples now, what are those keys? Those giant men's restroom at a gas station size keys and all of those pictures, what are they meant to symbolize? Is it the franchise rights? And unless anybody's going to be a member of your branch of the church, Peter, they're not really, that's how we're going to know what the real church is, because if we know you can trace it back to Peter, then it's the real one. I don't think so. I think those keys that Peter holds in his hands are the gospel message. That's what opens the door or closes it to a person entering or not entering into the kingdom. Jesus was entrusting the apostles with those keys. You know, I don't know if you have any keys on you right now. I actually have my keys with me, which is amazing because I usually can't find them. You know, and I, and I have these keys and, and I hardly ever think about them. You know, I got, I got a key for the mailbox. I got a key for my front door. I got a key for... One of my kids' houses, I'm not even sure which one it is usually. Uh, you know, I have a key for my bike lock and my trailer and a key for my car. And, and they, they lock or unlock things. Without the key, you can't get in. Or out. 
Exactly. Jesus is giving Peter and the disciples, there's a transition happening in that conversation with Peter. He says, your faith in me, I will build my kingdom on that. And you have the keys. Do you know you're walking out of here this morning with a pretty important set of keys? That's what I mean about identifying with Peter's story. Because if Peter's the only guy with the keys, but then we're like, well, phew, I can never remember where my keys are, so I'm glad he's got the keys. That's not, I'm not the Pope. You know, I'm not Peter, so that has nothing to do with me. No, I think it has everything to do with you and me. We're, we're walking out of there with a pretty important set of keys on us. And like Peter, we're meant to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jesus says to the group here, he says, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. What's that all about? It, it's this idea of people finding their way into the kingdom of God. It's that important, this gospel message that we've been given. Peter's narrative arc isn't just his only. It's yours, I think, as a disciple. What Simon's life says when it's looked at through the Simon, Cephas, Peter, rock stories, that's all ahead still for Simon in his life. He hasn't become yet, in this conversation with Jesus, that guy that's going to stand before the Sanhedrin. We're even going to see, possibly get into some of his stories in the book of Acts, how even in the book of Acts, he kind of fades out of the story. He just seems to become a regular, faithful, missionary, pastor, writer. We read and we're going to look at his two letters in the winter and we're going to see a guy that cares about the church and he cares about followers of Christ and he has this shepherd pastor's heart. A whole bunch of changes happened in this guy as a result of what Jesus has done in his life. So we hope to grow in our understanding with centuries to look back on about what Simon says or what Simon's life says. But I think our own life story is to follow a similar Christ-formed arc so that at the end of our story, it's not going to be so much about us, but it's going to be about how we became like Christ. What does Christ-likeness look like in a person who is not Christ? And, and isn't it interesting that we all try to figure out our identity and become our best self and to, to fulfill our, our own calling and destiny, and yet we're all called to become like Christ. <laughs> we're all called to be heading toward the same identity. Somehow, we'll all find our own personal identity by becoming like this one other person. And I think Peter gives us a template of what that looks like. It's sometimes important to have mentors, right? Somebody that's been there, done that, been faithful to the end, what does that even look like? Peter can be that for all of us. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, as you help us to um, kind of grow in our understanding of this one disciple of yours, that we won't do it as, as if we were studying a hero that's uh, separate, different, completely removed from us, but that we would look at Peter's life as an example of what you mean to do in all of our lives in so many ways. And, and I pray that we would become that um, disciple that you intend for us to be, the one that you could see right from the beginning, and that we would grow in our understanding of you and as a result, more fully become ourselves. I pray for this responsibility of keys, the gospel message, that we wouldn't forget that this isn't just about some kind of self-improvement or becoming a better disciple, but that it's also connected with this heavy responsibility we share with keys to the kingdom of God. Nobody gets into it without the gospel. Nobody comes to the Father except through you. And there's only one way. And I pray that you'd help us to remember that even as we go from this place. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.